Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. Welcome back to the Radiology Review Podcast. On this episode, I will discuss BIRAD's descriptors for MRI, mammography, and ultrasound for the radiology core exam. This is a high-yield topic because these BIRAD's descriptors are not only high-yield for real-life clinical practice, but they are also very amenable to multiple-choice-style testing. In particular, one needs to pay attention to what BIRADS is telling us about options for describing margins of a mass, shape of a mass, and other characteristic features for breast lesions on mammography, ultrasound, and MRI. I want to refer all of you to the ACR BIRADS Atlas 5th edition quick reference card that is currently the most current reference card available for the BIRADS Atlas that you can obtain for free from the ACR.org. I will put a note for this quick reference guide from the ACR in the show notes for this episode. I will also make a free downloadable study guide on this topic available on my website, theradiologyreview.com. Without further ado, let's get into the questions and answers for this episode. First question, what are the BIRAD's 5th edition descriptors for typically benign calcifications on mammography? The typically benign calcification descriptors in BIRAD's 5th edition are skin calcifications, vascular calcifications, coarse or popcorn-like calcifications, large rod-like calcifications, round calcifications, rim calcifications, dystrophic calcifications, milk of calcium, and sutural calcifications. You do need to know what each of these looks like on mammography, so if you don't know what one of these specific types of typically benign calcifications looks like, go ahead and look that up. I want to remind you that BIRADS is telling you that these are benign types of calcifications. So if they show you one of these on your board exam and ask you what the BIRADS score is, I think it is clear that BIRADS is telling you that these are all BIRADS 2 lesions, meaning benign. Now in real life practice, one may choose to assign these either a BIRADS 1 or a BIRADS 2, but on radiology board exams, give all of these a BIRADS 2. Let's talk about a few of these in more detail. Coarse or popcorn-like calcifications are especially high yield for radiology board exams because they are characteristically benign and test writers want to make sure that you know that these are a manifestation typically of a degenerating fibroadenoma. So particularly if you see a mass that contains these popcorn-like calcifications, they are probably leading you down the road of a benign fibroadenoma. Large rod-like calcifications are most typical for secretory calcifications, which are sometimes also termed plasma cell mastitis. Now, these types of calcifications are also something you need to be extremely aware of in terms of radiology board exam testing, and I would remember that these are most typical in individuals who are something like 15 to 20 years post-menopause. You should not see these large rod-like secretory type calcifications in a 35-year-old, for example. And if you do see something like that in a 35-year-old, you need to be very suspicious for ductal carcinoma in situ. I also think it's important to know milk of calcium You need to have this down for radiology core exams, and you need to remember that these are the calcifications that change configuration depending on whether you are looking at them on the CC view or on an MLO or ML orthogonal view. These calcifications typically look amorphous on the CC view, and then you get something like a lateral magnification view, and you start to see those amorphous-looking calcifications on the CC view start to layer and teacup on the lateral view, and then you can confirm with confidence that these are milk of calcium. Sutural calcifications are something that are not commonly seen anymore because surgeons are less commonly using sutures in the breast 
But if an individual does have a suture in the breast over time, that can calcify. And these typically manifest as what looks like a sutural knot that is calcified with the knot of the suture in the center and the two tails of the suture extending outward from the knot. Look that up if you have not seen those yet. Let's go ahead and move on. Next question. What are the BIRADS descriptors for suspicious morphology calcifications? The BIRADS descriptors for suspicious morphology calcifications are amorphous, coarse heterogeneous, fine pleomorphic, and fine linear or fine linear branching. Because the ACR has already labeled these as suspicious morphology calcifications, you know that these will typically be a BIRADS 4, or in select cases, a BIRADS 5 lesion because they are suspicious. These all will warrant biopsy, typically with stereotactic guidance, although one can also sample these at times with tomosynthesis guidance on newer biopsy machines, or potentially with ultrasound if you're in a pinch, but that's beyond the core exam. It is important that you know what each of these types of calcifications look like, and I would remember that out of all of these, the pattern of suspicious calcifications that has the highest positive predictive value or likelihood of being malignant are the fine linear branching calcifications. Next, what are the BIRADS descriptors for breast composition on mammography? According to the 5th edition BIRADS Atlas, breast composition is divided into four categories based on increasing breast density that are labeled as categories A through D as follows. A, the breasts are almost entirely fatty. B, there are scattered areas of fibroglandular density. C, the breasts are heterogeneously dense, which may obscure small masses. D, the breasts are extremely dense, which lowers the sensitivity of mammography. Sometimes you may see these simply referred to as categories A through D, I don't personally think the core exam will test you on those A through D descriptors, but they will want you to know what the options are in terms of fatty, scattered, heterogeneously dense, and extremely dense breast parenchyma. Also, remember that categories C and D, where you have either heterogeneously or extremely dense breast tissue, are categories of dense breast tissue in which the sensitivity of mammography may be reduced, so supplemental screening, especially for high-risk women, may be especially important for individuals with dense breast tissue. Next, what are BIRADS descriptors for margins of a mass on mammography? BIRADS descriptors for mass margins on mammography are circumscribed, obscured, microlobulated, indistinct, and spiculated. Remember that it is the spiculated masses that are most commonly the BIRADS category 5 lesions, and these often have associated architectural distortion. Note that there is a difference between spiculated margins and architectural distortion. The spiculated margins pertain to the mass itself. The margins of the mass will look spiculated, whereas architectural distortion is an effect that happens on the surrounding breast parenchyma, whether there is a central mass or otherwise. Obscured typically refers to masses wherein large portions of the mass margins are obscured by something like dense breast tissue. Indistinct, I like to think about as a mass where you can see the margins, but they're very ill-defined. Not speculated, but on the other hand, kind of blurred, so it would be difficult to trace the margins with a pencil. And circumscribed means that you clearly have a smooth walled mass that you can trace the margins with a pencil. Next, what are BIRADS descriptors for margins of a mass on ultrasound? On ultrasound, it is important to remember that the first descriptor division is whether the mass is circumscribed or not circumscribed. If the mass is circumscribed, you simply state a circumscribed mass is present and you are done describing the margins. If the mass is not circumscribed, then you have additional options that apply, which are indistinct, angular, microlobulated, and spiculated. 
and all of these descriptors for a non-circumscribed mass are potentially suspicious for malignancy. Next, what are Bayrad's descriptors for margins of a mass on MRI? Similar to ultrasound, margins of a mass on MRI begin with the determination of whether the mass is circumscribed or not circumscribed. If the mass is not circumscribed, similar to ultrasound, additional descriptors apply, which in this case are irregular or speculated. Go ahead and review those margin descriptors for mammography, ultrasound, and MRI again. Download the study guide at theradiologyreview.com and check out the ACR quick reference guide, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. Next, what are Bayraz descriptors for internal enhancement characteristics of masses on MRI? For masses on MRI, internal enhancement characteristics are homogeneous, heterogeneous, rim enhancement, and dark internal septations. Note that rim enhancement is typically benign, such as that surrounding a seroma or inflamed cyst, if it is thin and uniform. However, if rim enhancement is thick or nodular, this can be suspicious and associated with malignancy. Dark internal septations are most classic on the core exam for a fibroadenoma, but not exclusively so, and can unfortunately also be seen with some malignancies. Next, what are Bayraz's descriptors for internal enhancement patterns of non-mass enhancement on MRI? It is important to remember that internal enhancement characteristics on MRI vary depending on whether you are looking at a mass or non-mass enhancement. For non-mass enhancement, these descriptors are homogeneous, heterogeneous, clumped, or clustered ring internal enhancement. Note that clustered ring enhancement pattern of non-mass enhancement is probably the most commonly tested of these on board exams, so make sure you know what this looks like and realize that this is a very suspicious pattern of enhancement for ductal carcinoma in situ. Because what you are seeing is enhancement of the walls of the ducts involved with ductal carcinoma in situ, and these look like clustered rings on MRI. Next, according to Byrads, what are the associated features of breast cancer that should be evaluated on MRI? According to Byrads, on MRI, associated features of breast cancer that need to be evaluated and reported if present are nipple retraction, nipple invasion, skin retraction, skin thickening, skin invasion, which is further broken down to direct skin invasion versus skin invasion from inflammatory carcinoma, axillary adenopathy, pectoralis muscle invasion, chest wall invasion, and architectural distortion. Remember that if you simply see enhancement of the pectoralis, this is pectoralis muscle invasion, but not necessarily chest wall invasion. And again, you need to know what each of these looks like on MRI, so that is part of your board preparation. Next, according to Byrads, Fat-containing lesions on MRI include what entities? The fat-containing lesions on MRI, according to Byrads, at least on the quick reference guide, include lymph nodes, which can be normal or abnormal depending on whether the morphology is normal or abnormal, as well as fat necrosis, hamartomas, and post-operative seromas or hematomas with internal fat. Remember on MRI to compare between the non-fat saturated and fat saturated images to confirm intralesional fat on MRI, whether you are looking at a breast MRI or any other type of MRI such as an abdominal MRI. Those fat saturated images can be very helpful. Next, what are the background parenchymal enhancement descriptors on MRI per Byrads? 
According to BIRADS, the level of background parenchymal enhancement on a breast MRI should be reported as minimal, mild, moderate, or marked. This may thereafter be reported as being asymmetric or symmetric between the breasts. Note that all of these background enhancement level descriptors begin with M, like minimal, mild, moderate, or marked. This can help you avoid confusion that a breast that has the highest degree of background enhancement has marked enhancement and not extreme enhancement. Remember that extreme is a descriptor for the amount of fibroglandular tissue on either mammography or MRI, but not for background parenchymal enhancement. Next question, what are Byrad's descriptors for shapes of a mass on MRI, ultrasound, and mammography? Shapes of a mass on MRI, ultrasound, or mammography are oval, round, and irregular. In my head to help me remember this, I rearranged the order to ROI, round oval irregular, because that is easier for me to remember because it's already a known phrase, ROI, in radiology for region of interest. So in this case, I also remember ROI, round oval irregular. Maybe that is helpful to you. I would note that of these descriptors, oval is the most benign shape statistically, although oval masses can still be cancer. Round is more suspicious for breast cancer than an oval mass. And of course, irregular is the most suspicious shape in terms of chances of malignancy. Next, true or false? Per Byrad's description of the orientation of a mass as parallel or non-parallel, applies only to ultrasound. The answer here is true. We typically do not describe masses as parallel or non-parallel on mammography or MRI, but do describe this routinely on ultrasound. Remember that masses with non-parallel orientation are more suspicious than masses with parallel orientation. Next question. What are Byrad's echo pattern descriptors on ultrasound? Byrad's echo pattern descriptors on ultrasound are anechoic, hyperechoic, complex, cystic and solid, hypoechoic, isoechoic, and heterogeneous. Again, it is important to know what each of these looks like. I would remember that in particular complex cystic and solid masses are potentially suspicious for malignancy, so those would typically be a Byrad's 4 lesion. And do not confuse a complicated cyst with a complex cyst, wherein the complex cyst has both cystic and solid components and is suspicious for malignancy, whereas a complicated cyst may be something like a Byrad's 2 or a Byrad's 3 lesion, depending on the scenario. Next, what is the reference to which the echogenicity of a breast mass should be compared to determine whether it is hypo, iso, or hyperechoic on ultrasound? For breast ultrasound, normal subcutaneous fat in the breast is the reference by which echogenicity should be determined. For example, a hyperechoic lesion, hyper H-Y-P-E-R, Echoic lesion is one that is hyperechoic compared to normal subcutaneous fat in the breast. Next, what is the reference to which density of a mass on mammography is compared? Unlike on breast ultrasound, normal breast fibroglandular tissue and not fat is the reference for density on a mammogram. A high-density mass, for example, is a mass that is more dense than normal breast fibroglandular tissue in that breast on mammography. Density options for masses on mammography are specified by BIRADS to be high-density, equal-density, low-density, and fat-containing. Next, what are the associated features of breast cancer for mammography that should be evaluated and reported if present according to BIRADS? Associated features of breast cancer on mammography include skin retraction, 
nipple retraction, skin thickening, trabecular thickening, axillary adenopathy, architectural distortion, and calcifications. Next, what are the four types of asymmetries on mammography per BIRADS? The four types of asymmetries on mammography are first, an asymmetry, and that would denote a single view finding whether on CC or MLO or perhaps full lateral. A one view asymmetry is an asymmetry. A global asymmetry is an asymmetry that encompasses more than one quadrant on a mammogram. A focal asymmetry is similar to an asymmetry but is seen by necessity of definition on two views. If you only have a one view asymmetry, that is not a focal asymmetry, it must be seen on at least two views. A developing asymmetry is an asymmetry that was not present on a prior mammogram and is now seen, therefore it has developed and developing asymmetries are more suspicious for cancer than an asymmetry or focal asymmetry on a baseline mammogram because with a developing asymmetry, you can confirm that there has been a change in the breast. Next, what are BIRAD's descriptors for distribution of calcifications on mammography? Distribution of calcifications on mammography per BIRADS are diffuse, regional, grouped, linear, and segmental. I have listed these in order of least to most suspicious. So again, least suspicious would be diffuse, slightly more suspicious regional, slightly more suspicious grouped, even more suspicious linear, and most suspicious is segmental. The reason why is because these correspond with increasing likelihood of being an introductal malignant process, wherein if you have segmental calcifications, those are highly suspicious for an introductal pattern of calcifications, and unless these are typically benign, such as secretory calcifications, those would be suspicious. Last and final question for this episode. What are BIRAD's descriptors for distribution of non-mass enhancement on MRI? Similar to describing the distribution of calcifications on mammography, we also should describe the distribution of non-mass enhancement on MRI. And your options are focal, linear, segmental, regional, multiple regions, and diffuse. That concludes this episode. I hope this was helpful for many of you. Remember to download the free study guide at theradiologyreview.com. I also want to make a quick reminder to you or shout out if you are not aware that there is a podcast erratum link on my website, theradiologyreview.com. I do try my best to be as accurate as possible, but I have not been perfect in my attempts. One topic I want to mention here is is that on a prior breast imaging episode, I discussed the mammography quality control phantom. I said that you must be able to see at least four of six fibers, three of five spec groups, and three of five masses on a phantom test in order to pass that test. But there are now new updated ACR phantoms that no longer follow this classic 4-3-3 rule, but instead commonly follow a 2-3-2 rule. There's more information about this issue on theradiologyreview.com under the podcast or Adam link. So go ahead and check that out if you want to read more. Thank you also to some listeners who helped point out this issue on my prior podcast episode. Keep up the good work and study hard. Remember, you have to study really hard to succeed on radiology board exams. So prepare to succeed. I will catch you on the next episode. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment.